So the other day I walked into our living room and I witnessed Catherine and our children watching Disney's The Lion King, Um, the original one, the animated one, the correct one, (laughs) not this poor remake that just came out in theaters. Instantly, a wave of nostalgia overtook me. And I felt compelled to abandon whatever previous endeavor had held my attention and to sit down and watch this movie with them. As a child, this was a movie that I had on VHS and watched over and over again. Catherine and I found ourselves singing all the songs and quoting the lines. Our children looked at us like we were weird. But it was a fun moment in time to sit and watch something that was important to both of us and to share that moment with our children, to see their faces enthralled by the action and the sequence of events. Towards the end of the film, there's a scene in which Simba is visited by the spirit of his father, Mufasa. Now, perhaps it's that I'm at a different stage in my life, but I noticed that this scene impacted me a little bit more than I remember as a child. Simba is struggling with what he feels are the mistakes of his past. He's run away from his home. He's grown up with Timon and Pumbaa and a a life free of responsibilities and rules. But deep down, you get the sense that he knows that running from who he is and where he comes from is wrong. But he feels trapped. As Simba stares into this reflection pool that Rafiki, the wise monkey, has led him to, he hears the iconic voice of James Earl Jones, who plays his father, He appears in the clouds and tells Simba, you are more than you have become. Remember who you are. Remember. Our text today deals with remembrance. This short letter attributed to the Apostle Paul comes to the community of faith in Colossae. Within the context of this letter, it appears that some form of doctrine or teaching has crept in and is now at work against the people of God in this young community of faith. The scriptures refer to this teaching as a philosophy, some sort of human tradition full of empty deceit. Scholars today continue to debate over the exact nature of this teaching, what it is, where it's crept from, and what are its origins. Those are all a matter of debate. From the text, we're unable to garner anything definitive, but whatever it is, is becoming a hindrance to this body of Christ. So I would argue that Paul is offering here a plea for remembrance Paul reminds the young church that the things that are coming to them now are only a shameful representation of the glory of God and the, rich, and the richness. These teachings are but a shadow of wisdom compared to the reality which has been revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah for the world. Paul wants to jar them loose from this bondage that left unattended might sink in and change their course. It's as if Paul is saying to them, brothers and sisters, do not let your imagination be taken by the vain and fleeting things of the world. These elemental teachings are trying to rob you of remembering who you are. So take action before it's too late. Don't let the amnesia 
set in. We also have to understand that Paul's tactic here with his brothers and sisters is one of subversion to the empire that is always looming behind the scenes of the text. The empire wants to control the imaginations of the people. The empire, like any other power structure of the world, wants allegiance. The empire wants to say what is permissible and what is not, what can be and what cannot be. In other words, the society which this body of believers finds themselves located is one where the collective imagination of the people is threatened by the established order of the present reality. Rome says what goes. These people are subjected to what they can touch, taste, and see. And Paul is concerned that if the people fail to grasp the movement they belong to, they run the risk of forgetting to whom they belong. They run the risk of forgetting where the true source of wisdom and knowledge resides. They run the risk of playing into the hands of the empire. Recently, I saw a story about a politician in the United Kingdom who had some very choice words about women in the Islamic tradition. He compared the burqas that they wear, the full clothing garments that cover them from head to toe as the clothing resembling that of terrorists. And when a politician says something like this, it's the job of journalists and camera crews to pester him or her, hoping to get a word of clarification. So a team of reporters did just that. They camped outside this politician's home for several hours, hoping to catch him coming in or out that they might receive some sort of clarification. After many hours of waiting, the politician emerged from his home wearing casual clothing, t-shirts and shorts, and he was holding a tray of tea. Remember, we're in the UK, they don't drink coffee. And he had these mugs of tea in hand and a smile on his face. There was a bag of sugar, a jar of cream. As the reporters began to question him about his comments, after all, that's why they were there He simply smiled, turned on his charm, used his political wit. He informed them that he wasn't going to answer any questions. He just noticed that they had been there a while and thought they might be thirsty and wanted to offer them a cup of tea. Within 30 seconds of his encounter with them, they were all laughing. They were thanking him for the tea. They collectively forgot what they were there to do. They allowed their imaginations to be taken captive. Friends, this mindset is what Paul's combating in these pages. Don't be charmed to sleep. Don't give in to the temptation to be lulled by the earthly traditions that want to co-opt your imagination. Seek those things that are above, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. Set your mind to the liberating reach of our Lord and Savior who has disarmed the principalities and powers of the empire. Allow your imagination to be captivated by the scope of Christ's rule over the created order. Don't succumb to the temptation that the way things are is the way they should be or even remain. Because Christ has disarmed all powers and all authority in heaven and on earth is his. So don't let the empires of the world dictate what God's kingdom will look like. As is our tradition on the first Sunday 
of the month, and in a few minutes we will take communion together. This is a meal that emphasizes not only the reconciliation of God, but the vast power and authority of Christ Jesus. As Andrew and I have said a time or two before, who you had table fellowship with in the first century was a big deal. But what the Lord has done through the cross and the resurrection has broken down the barrier that would divide us and restrain our place at this table. This meal is a resistance to the power structures that would divide us. It declares that we are a people with a different ethic. It calls us to imagine a place where all are invited to partake of God's heavenly banquet. It calls us to stand firm in the conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord and the Caesars of the world are not. It calls us to remember that the way things are is not necessarily the way things should be or will be. Christ will have the final victory. So friends, remember. Remember that in Christ you have died to the elemental spirits of this world. In Christ, you have been buried in baptism and raised to new life. In Christ, you have been given access to the wealth of knowledge and wisdom. Do not settle for the things of this world. Let the Spirit of Christ dwell within you richly and stir up your imagination that you may never forget. And then you will be ready to go into the world to proclaim the good news. Remember who you are. Amen.